In the standard definition, a language is considered dead when it has no native speakers, as in no one is learning it as a baby. That's what it really means to be a living language. There have to be babies, young children learning it as a first language in that window between zero and around five years old, where any young child is able to very quickly learn any language he or she is exposed to. And that ma that's, what makes a, that was, that's what makes life for a language, is to have these new speakers coming up and speaking it generation by generation. As soon as that chain is broken and there are no more native speakers, no more first language learners of that language, it will be considered dead. But unlike with uh, biological beings, uh, there's, there's kind of uh, two levels of death when it comes to a language. There's, there's dead and then there's extra dead, or really dead. So a language is dead if it has no native speakers, but there could still be second language learners. There can be cases where some people are still learning it, you know, as older children or as adults, and, and, and that would not be the same level of death as a language where nobody ever deals with it at all anymore. Uh, and you can see uh, some of these languages that are officially dead actually have a lot of prestige and they even can be considered classical languages just like Latin. The, of course the standard example of a dead language being Latin, same with ancient Greek, same with Sanskrit, and many other languages that in various parts of the world are considered to be classical in some way. But then there are those languages that have no native speakers and no second language learners. And those languages are called even more dead than dead, they're called extinct. Extinct languages are completely done. Although, once again, in contrast with a biological being, it is possible to resurrect one of these extinct languages because all you have to do is start to teach it again to young children and once you get babies learning the language again as their first language you then make it living again so let's take a look at some of these uh, extinct languages and you know you could imagine that if you wanted to, you could bring any one of them back. You just have to have the commitment to actually teach your child to speak and you'd have to have enough uh, people doing this that you could actually get a community going. Um, but uh, you know, the best, this has been done and the, the best example, the biggest example in the world is Hebrew. Ancient Hebrew was never fully extinct because it remained as a classical and a liturgical language or religious language. It was never fully extinct, but it was dead. Hebrew lost all its native speakers, but it was revived in the 19th and especially 20th century. And you can see some uh, lesser examples such as in Cornish, the Cornish language of Cornwall in Western England uh, was also uh, revived to some degree. And there's a few others as well. So it is possible. But sad to say that, you know, it takes quite, a, it takes quite a, an alignment of factors, you know, having uh, a community there ready to speak it and everything, you know, you, you have to have the conditions to be able to get this new community forming that actually really wants to speak this language. And that's a lot to ask for because you'd have to have a good reason, uh, you know, to, have to teach your children a particular language. Uh, it can't just be a, you know, something to do for fun, even though it would be fun. But of course, uh, language is something that there, there's such a strong pressure to teach children a language that will actually be useful for them, you know, economically, socially, whatever. If, if they're speaking a language that almost nobody else speaks, uh, that can be quite limiting for them. Um, so uh, a lot of things have to line up to bring one of these languages back. And most of these languages will never come back. So take a look at list of languages by time of extinction. Okay, so, um, oh, and here's an extra detail of the definition that you sometimes see, no descendant languages. Now Latin, of course Latin is still 
this, it's not extinct because it's still used as a classical language, but it also has descendant languages. I mean, you could say Latin is not even really dead because it became Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and so on. Um, so it has descendant languages. But if a language has no descendant languages and no native speakers, and I would also say, I'd also add no second language speakers, you can see this definition is a little bit different. It doesn't say no second language speakers, but that would also be, I would consider to be part of a truly extinct language. It's one that's really disappeared from the face of the earth. No one speaks it as a first language or as a second language. It doesn't have any daughter languages. Uh, and it really only exists as a memory. Uh, although actually, where's the memory? Yeah, it doesn't, even, it doesn't even exist as a memory for most people. But if it is recorded somehow, um, if there's some kind of writing, or some kind of record of it, it could at least be remembered in that way. Well, let's go back. I want to go back to like some ancient times here at the bottom to, to look at some really old extinct languages. Um, so, example here, from the third millennium BC. Wow, okay, so some language named Gutian. What a mysterious language. So. You can see here that it's unclassified. I mean, they have no idea what language, uh, what languages it might be connected to. Um, all that is known is that there were the Gudian people very briefly in the 22nd century BC, they ruled over the land of Sumer in Mesopotamia. And they lived some in some area around here. And all that's known is that it existed as a language uh, and that it has some names in this famous king list. Um, great source of ancient history uh, knowledge is these, these ancient lists of kings, um, some of them mythological, but uh, that give, in many cases, our only glimpse into some of the, these ancient worlds. And they had some kings who were Gutian kings, like here. King Inkishush, King Zarlagab, great name. And all these, these names, like, these are the last, these are the only pieces we have of this language. I mean, this is truly something lost in the mist of time that, you know, we don't even know anything about that. I mean, does it even exist as a language? Barely, there's barely any information. You can see there's a whole theory that it might be connected to to Karian, which would be a branch of Indo-European, but that's just a theory. So Gutian remains a truly, a truly mysterious language lost in far ancient history, in this time that was ancient even in the ancient world. So let's go on to look at another one. Um, let's see here, going back into still ancient history. Um, ooh, how about this Tartessian? So here we're looking into, it's called Paleo-Hispanic, so Old Spanish. You can see it's in Southern Spain and Portugal. And it exists in inscriptions. So there, there's actually some writing record here. So it's a lot more evidence than just, you know, than just like a list of some king names. There's actually some writing in the script, more than just names. And okay, so it's called Tartessian. And they attempt to date it by dating the inscriptions. And here there's th this culture known as Tartessian was considered to probably be an older version of the Turditani culture, which is a you know, slightly, slightly better understood ancient culture. Um, but It's really quite mysterious, the details here. Here is a list of some of the characters of this language. And you can see that yeah, there's some possible correspondences with what we know. Like here, A ah is A. Ah. Well, isn't that nice? You know, although <laughs> this looks like O oh, when it's A, so that's not clear. But you know, you have this look, kind of looks like a K. Of course, this is just one proposed um, system. But here's th these are the kind of symbols that were were used in this in, in in these inscriptions. So you just have yeah and then there's 
there's, uh, yeah, it's generally considered unclassified because there's simply not enough evidence to know if it's possibly connected to anything. Um, so there's been arguments, yeah, maybe it's related to the Celtic branch of Indo-European, maybe, uh, but there's simply not enough information. We can look into some of these uh, examples of the inscriptions here. Um, and that's all that's left. A language that has more or less disappeared. Okay, so let's do one from the, some kind of the middle times here. Anything look interesting? Well, the Hun, well, there's the famous language of the Huns, the famous Huns who swept through the remains of the Roman Empire. Um, what was the Hunnic language? Well, it's called Hunnic because they, they assume that the Hun, it's a language that the Huns were speaking, but not much is known about it. Pardon me. So, no inscriptions. No whole sentences. All they can use to reconstruct this language is a few names that were written in Greek and Latin sources. And so how can you even figure out what this language is about? No evidence of how it might be connected. Of course, there's theories, of course, can be connected to other languages of Central Asia, other language groups, Turkic, Mongolic, Iranian, and Nisaean even Indo-European. All those are possible, but no conclusive information. So we have all these debates about what is it might be connected to. There's the idea that it might have a written script, but the rest is lost in history. So it even has an official language code, but almost nothing is known. And finally, we'll look at a more modern example because just as you see with uh, endangered species, like the uh, extin species extinctions are increasing in modern times, while language extinctions as well, as you see many languages. Of course, this is partly due to the fact that more languages are known in recent times. Um, so there would have been many languages disappearing in ancient times as well. But those, those languages, uh, in, you know, a lot of them, they wouldn't have ever, ever been studied. They would have disappeared before ever having been discovered. So we wouldn't even know. But in modern times, there are many languages that have been identified and been shown to uh, then disappear. All throughout here, 19th, 20th century, the list is getting long. And we can go all the way to modern times right now. What do we have here? By 2024, what do we have? Let's take the Moses Columbia language, Columbia Moses language, a Salish language. This is the speakers of the Western, uh, Western North America. Here you can see Northern Idaho, Eastern Washington State in the United States. And here we see an example. When you get to these recent extinct languages, you have a final speaker. So there it was, age 96, Pauline Stensger died in 2023 at age 96, the last fluent speaker. These, these modern ones would have been, they could have been uh, studied, there could have been recordings made, which is a nice development that since the era of audio recording, it's now possible to preserve some of these languages past, past their end. But you can see this list is continuing. And out of the, out of the estimated 7,000 languages in the world, approximately 7,000, most of them are endangered. And it seems quite likely that, you know, really, over half of them uh, will also go extinct in the near future. So there'll be many more to add to this list. And it's pretty sad that uh, in the future, the, 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 the trends and the patterns that lead to languages disappearing, um, speakers moving to speak other languages, they have less connection to their, uh, their inherited language and move to speak a more widespread language spoken over a wider area or spoken by 
those with more money and power that, uh, you know, so it's a more economically useful, it's more economically useful to learn a language that is spoken uh, by people with money and power over a wider area. It's less economically useful to speak a language that is only spoken in a small, isolated community. Um, so there needs to be a strong counterforce of really taking it seriously and really placing a high value on preserving the traditional inherited language. That seems to be what allows it to, to survive. Assuming, of course, economic survival as well. You can place a high priority on uh, your culture and tradition, but you still have to survive. So the combination of those things uh, have to really line up in order for these languages to not disappear. But the trend line is towards many of these disappearing. And so here we see a quick look at the graveyard of languages.